Hello. And welcome to the episode of Todd Talks. And Todd Talks people listen, and you have to deal with it! Hopefully. And today, we are here to talk about the death battle that is going to be coming up very, very soon. Korra from Legend of Korra, aka the Avatar Cartoon Universe, versus Storm of the X-Men. Now, before we start, I just want to say, this is the best Korra matchup you cannot tell me otherwise. Alright, Korra versus Ray was d whack, and I didn't even know who Delson was, because I never played Il Infamous. Alright, and for all of you who have been insulting me about liking Korra vs. Storm, stop it. Get some help. Anyway, I'm very excited for this matchup, even though the, uh, the victor is incredibly <laughs> obvious, but we'll get to that later. So, Korra. This is a Korra as a series means a lot to me for reasons I'll, I'll get to later. But um, this was a series that honestly wasn't supposed to happen because Avatar: The Last Airbender is widely considered one of the greatest animated series of all time. Not just like American animation, but like animation all time, right? And so the creators did not have an idea for a sequel series. They they told their story, and then a person said, "Well, why don't you just do like one about a female Avatar?" And then they're like, "Yeah, okay." So, this one is set about, uh, what was the definitive timeline? Like, 60 years? Yeah, 60 years, give or take, after the events of uh, Avatar Last Airbender, where Aang defeated Ozai, Zuko became the Fire Lord, and etc., etc. Uh, Aang has been dead for close to about 20 years. And Korra is the new Avatar, and yes, you have to deal with it. So... Right off the bat, we, we see how different Korra is, because Aang is calm-ish, uh, like very balanced in his spiritual nature. He, he's a pacifist, as we if you might remember from uh, Aang versus Edward Elric, and he doesn't want to be the Avatar. Korra wants to be the Avatar. She loves everything about being the Avatar. She loves the fact that she is the Avatar and wants to show it off. The only problem was that when she was a child, as we learned in Season 3, uh, well, two and three. Um, she was almost kidnapped by a group known as the Red Lotus who wanted to kill off the Avatar in full um, and thus bring a different kind of rule to the world. And because of that, Korra was very sheltered as a child. She was trained in what they called a compound at the South Pole. And through that, she was <laughs> not exactly exposed to the world. And so when she became old enough and had already mastered three elements long before probably she was expected to, um, she was supposed to be trained by Aang San Tenzin to become the Avatar in full and then be introduced to the world at large. Uh, things happened, and so she decided to run away to Republic City, a place that was made by Aang and uh, Fire Lord Zuko, uh, to try and bring peace to the realm. And this kickstarted a long journey for her, four seasons in fact, plus books, and it showcased just how cool of an avatar it, she is, even if she's not exactly the best person ever. <laughs> because as I said, Aang and Korra are literally opposites. I, that, that was actually part of the appeal, because again, Aang was a pacifist, Korra is aggressive. Um, Aang is balanced within himself. Korra likes to push things and and try to enforce her own will. Again, I love Korra, and I'll explain why a little bit later. But um, Korra has a very straightforward way of dealing with things. If she doesn't like it, she's going to take care of it, and she'll do it in her own way. In fact, in the first episode, we see her go to Republic City and face a, a gang known as the Triads, and she absolutely owns them, but she just so happens to destroy property in the first place, and then when the metal bending police comes in, they she runs and takes them out as well until they eventually subdue her. And then we meet uh, Lin Beifong, Toph's daughter, also a boss. Just saying. Like mother, like daughter, right? Anyway, so uh, <laughs> part of Korra's initial journey was the fact that because of her upbringing in terms of being more sheltered she wants to be outgoing she wants to do everything and she doesn't have that special balance that she needs to learn airbending and in fact she just can't use it at all uh, this is different a little bit different from Aang who was just fearful of firebending especially after what when he burned Katara's hands Korra just couldn't do it 
And so through her fights with the Equalist and Amon, she learned uh, how to finally let go. And in her weakest state, she finally embraced her spirituality to the extent that she could airbend. And then after that, she finally connected with Aang via the Avatar state and was able to become the Avatar in full by the end of season one. And then season two happened, which was a horrible season. <laughs> Even the team admitted that season two of, of Legend of Korra was horrible. They had a different animation studio. Uh, the story took forever to come through. The animation took forever to come through. It was 424 days between season one and season two of, of Legend of Korra. I, I it, yeah, it was. I will always remember that. Uh, maybe it was 34. Doesn't matter. It was it was over 400 days. So yeah, that was that was that was bad. But uh, through her journey, she also fought things that Aang honestly did not. Aang rarely tangled with the spirits. He went to the spirit world, but he never had a tangle with spirits on their own. Uh, outside of the panda spirit and uh, technically one of the koi fish, but he actually teamed up with that one. Anyway, so she had to go and fight dark spirits. And it was there that we learned the true nature of the Avatar versus the spirits of Rava and Vatu. Uh, Rava, who was actually in the Avatar via the uh, her connection with the original one named Juan. Get it? Juan. Juan. Yeah, so clever. Uh, <laughs> so eventually through that, she grew able to not just uh, do things like energy bending, which she learned from Aang via the Avatar state, but she also was able to open portals to the spirit world, which is something we did not know an Avatar could do before. And she was able to actually purify spirits via water bending. And it was actually really cool. So uh, the season was not though. But anyway, uh, through that, she actually lost her avatar cycle because Rava was ripped from her body. And eventually, though, she got put into it and she could still use the avatar state. It wasn't exactly the same. And then the world got even crazier because the spirits all came into the world and uh, airbenders started appearing up like mad because of the reopening of the spirit realms, I guess. And then uh, the Earth, one of the Earth Kingdom nations, a metal bending. Play, uh, the metal bending section decided to try and take over everything in the Earth Kingdom. Uh, Kavira. It was a lot. <laughs> oh, and did I mention that Korra got kidnapped and she got poisoned so she that she would lose her uh, bending abilities and she spent three years basically just walking around trying to get back to her real estate because she didn't believe she ever get healed. And then she did get healed because she actually had to pull, pull the poison out of her body with help from Tafu, who's still not dead because she's a boss. And event eventually she went to the spirit world on vacation. Did I mention that? <laughs> and that's something into the books where apparently her team was brainwashed and then she had to get help from Kavira to unbrainwash them. And it's it's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. Anyway, but Akora did learn a lot on her journey. And the key thing here was her bending abilities. Because when we first meet her, she is well versed in the three elements of three of the four elements of fire, water, and earth. And then eventually she learned air bending to where she actually used it as much as her other more natural abilities because they are inherently a bit more aggressive, whereas Airbending is more about being evasive and defensive. So, as an avatar, she can control all four elements, including now a fifth element of metal bending. She is the only avatar uh, that we know of who is able to... It's specifically shades. she's the first, though. Uh, she's the first avatar to learn metal bending, and she could do it with a great deal of precision and skill as she was trained by Su Beifang, uh, daughter of Toth and sister to Lin, though from different fathers uh it's it's a thing it, it they got so weird at the end <laughs> anyway uh Korra's abilities are not to be mocked not the least of which is because unlike Aang her style is so in your face and aggressive that she's not afraid to just unleash absolute elemental fury upon you no matter what the situation is as long as you're the bad guy and this led to her going up against gangs and spirit deities and metal benders and uh, Amon, who was a bloodbender, uh, the, the Red Lotus and all their specialized benders and so on and so forth. Uh, when she's in the Avatar state, which is a very key thing here, um, she has enhanced abilities and the entire knowledge of all the Avatars before her, including Aang, uh, Roku, Kyoshi, and Wan and all of them. And she can perform even greater things than she could do on her own. The only catch with these abilities is that there has to be, there are certain conditions to use them. And you might remember these conditions being mentioned in both uh, the Aang's battle and Zuko's battle. Uh, the first is that this is not energy or elemental control, it is elemental bending. All right. 
Korra cannot just inherently summon water from her body or from you know random places in order to attack. The earth has she has to have something from earth to use earth. Air is air and fire are more natural. They can come from within or without. And water, it is stated she can actually pull moisture from the air, but there has to be moisture in the air. There is no moisture in this air. You know, that kind of thing. Also, it is bending techniques that help her control her uh, abilities. Uh, think about um, Zuko's fight with Todoroki. If you pin him down in certain ways, he can't bend. And there was a scene in, I believe it was season two or three of Avatar, where Korra gets the hand of Electra treatment and she can't bend because she has nothing, she's not able to move enough to bend with. Now, there are a few exceptions, like where she can actually do what the, the dragon breath technique, where she can breathe fire out of her mouth like a flamethrower, but even that's, you know, restrictive upon, you know, her being able to move her head. So, uh, and for those asking, yes, Korra will have the Avatar state, because remember, we're going at peak performance Korra, which means season two Avatar state before Rava was ripped from her body. So there is no doubt that they can, they will be using that. And then in terms of her power output, it's incredible at times, as we've already seen in her preview. Uh, we've seen Avatars hold up tidal waves, you certain you see avatars push islands uh and course battle was to hear she's like flying around uh the battlefield via ro fire-powered rocket feet uh which we've seen other uh, people do like a uh, legend of Korra version of ira which was azuga's son and uh, she was able to use air to destroy pillars and move them around she used a tidal wave to uh freeze and push and freeze Kavira's mech in season four. Um, past uh, and it was, when infused by the Avatar state, she is even uh, Ang. We saw Ang lift up or make a crater around a city in one of the books because the books are canon. And yeah, they are just incredibly powerful. All these avatars are, and because at Korra is just the latest in her line, she is as powerful as all of them. And because we know that she's had years of training, years and years of training, she had more, she had more training than Aang ever did. Um, but obviously Aang had more experience over time. Um, she knows how to use her elements to the best of her abilities. So she's there's a reason she's a tough foe. The problem, <laughs> as in all things, is her personality. Um, and by all things, I mean all of us. Our personalities are usually always our biggest detriment. So... Korra is aggressive to a fault. She gets herself and her friends in trouble at times because she thinks she knows what she's doing, and oftentimes she does not. Or she is easily influenced and tricked because of her emotional state, such as when her uncle, who was actually evil, revealed that uh, Korra's father intentionally held her in the South Pole because of the kidnapping attempt, and she went nuts and decided, yeah, I'm going to go join my uncle now because you suck. Until she found out her uncle was evil, and then her father was good, and then she had to go save her father, even because he was branded a traitor and was tried for treason, and was actually... No, never mind. So, and then there was a the time she was captured by Zaheer and her forces, which you think, oh, an avatar can't get captured, but there are special things that can limit the chi. That's another thing that holds back bending, is the chi in the body, and there are darts in their world that can actually limit your bending abilities, and she was affected by that. She was almost killed via poison, which is why she had that three-year... Sabbat sabbatical and uh during her training both in terms of air bending and trying to get back from her poison state uh she was so impatient she wanted everything to happen right now and that's not how it works and so she just she sometimes has to learn the hard way that you have to slow down you have to take things one breath at a time and you have to realize that there are more sides to this than you realize and while she did eventually get there she still has those faults. She is still incredibly aggressive. She prefers to be face to face with people and expects them to do the same. And they don't. That's not how it's not how the world works. And she thinks she has to do everything on her own, which she should know better than anybody. That's not how anything works. And um, it, it gets her in trouble a lot. So, yeah. Now, to go back to something I said earlier, the reason that Cora means a lot to me is that uh, Cora was the first was the show that inspired me to really go into writing. I wrote a fanfic, Avatar Spirit of Earth, and it got very popular because I just poured everything I had into it. And because of that, I wrote another thing, which led to me writing comics, and now I'm a comic writer with over 40 
books under my name and a couple novels as well. And I honestly want to name my daughter Cora if I ever have one. Because Cora to me is a symbol of strength and awesomeness and just never never yielding, even when it gets you in trouble. But Cora is awesome. She is the Avatar. And until we get that sequel series that allegedly is coming, I don't know, but allegedly it's coming. So until we get the next Avatar, she's who we have, and we shall be happy that she's here. Next up, I didn't mean for that to go 15 minutes. Uh, next up, we have Ororu Monroe. Ororu is actually the descendant of a long line of African priestesses uh, who have magical abilities, believe it or not. And this one mixed with her mutant ability made her one of the most important X-Men of all time. In fact, her arrival in X-Men was considered a major turning point along with Colossus and Wolverine. So, because she was not one of the original X-Men. She was one of the ones in a giant-sized X-Men that helped change the game. And it's not surprising to see why so many people liked Aurora. But when she was young, she was the daughter of a princess who, and her parents died in a plane crash. And because of this, she was left in Cairo, Egypt, basically on her own. She became a thief, a very good one too, until eventually she wandered into Kenya and realized her mutant ability. She can control the weather, but it's so much more than that. And with, after, after being hailed as a goddess, and why not? Um, she eventually re-met, she met him before, but she re-met Professor Charles Xavier, who um, asked her to be join his X-Men so that she could not just help the people of Kenya, but the people of the world at large. And her abilities made her one of the best mutants around. She is labeled as an Omega-level mutant. Now, what does that mean? Um, that is the highest power tier mutant out there. All right. So, for example, Cyclops is not an Omega level mutant, although there are some who would argue he is. Um, Wolverine is not a Omega level mutant. Uh, Colossus is not a Omega level mutant. Jean Grey is an Omega level mutant when she's at full uh, psychic power. Uh, Magneto, you could argue, is an Omega level mutant. And. I think actually he is technically one because of his magnetism powers. And so Storm is right up there with the top tier. Apocalypse is an Omega level mutant. Uh, top tier power level. Her level, her abilities make her so strong that she is someone you have to fear because of all she can do. And because of this, she's been an invaluable member to the X-Men over the years. She started as just a regular member. Wanted the team trying to learn the ways of the modern world because she had not grown up in it. She was a thief and then was a hail as a goddess and now is suddenly in New York City. Uh, talk about culture clash, right? Then she became its leader. She led multiple X Men teams over the years, including uh, this the base X Men, X Men Blue and Gold, where she led with Cyclops. She actually fought Cyclops multiple times for the leadership. She was part of the Hellfire Club. She was part of a global mutant task force known as XSE. Yeah. Um, she led the Morlocks, which is a cool thing. Um, she's led X-Force. She's been a part of X-Force, just in general. She was part of the Fantastic Four with her husband. Sorry, ex-husband. Let's just get them back together. Okay, they're a great match. Let's put them together. Um, they got an old. It, it, it was a thing. But uh, she was... Like I said, part of the X-Men, she was a part of the Avengers for a while before Avengers vs. X-Men happened, and even then she helped the Avengers out a little bit. Uh, and now, now, as of the House of X arc, she is currently the Regent of Mars. Oh, you didn't know that, did you? Yeah, the X-Men, via the power of their mutants and certain mutants from the, uh, uh, <laughs> how do I describe this loosely? The mutant nation of Arakbo, Arako, which is actually from another dimension of Rea Never mind. Just think of it as an uh, interdimensional nation of mutants came to Earth and they combined their powers so that they could terraform Mars and now the mutants own Mars. And Storm is their queen. <laughs> Hail to the queen, baby. So, yeah, that's that's just very loosely all the things that uh, Storm has done in her time. Trust me, there's a lot more. I didn't mention times where she was uh, the queen of Wakanda and helped various global missions. I didn't mention the time where she was uh, depowered and actually spent time on alternate Earth with Forge, who she was in love with. She's had a lot of love interests, I'm not gonna lie. She's had a lot of love interests over the years. But uh, she spent a, a year on an alternate Earth just to go and uh, get her powers back. And of course, the best part of all, Mohawk. Yeah, Mohawk Storm. 
See, I got enough hair, I can pull that off. I got Mo Mohawk Storm. She she's great. Uh, she's had various looks over the years. So uh, Storm has been a definitive member. In fact, it's it, you actually go so far as to say that the X Men would not be the same without Storm because of both her leadership, her confidence, her indomitable will. Like you cannot break Storm's will. Like, it's canon. You cannot. She was actually able to resist the hypnotic powers of Dracula. Alright? That's canon. Uh, it didn't start out that way, obviously, but she became someone who has such willpower that in when she was with T'Challa, she actually became a literal goddess because she could channel the power of faith and was able to reach a level of godhood so she could defeat a being called known as the adversary uh even loki was able to uh see storm's potential and gave her a hammer known as stormcaster which made her the goddess of thunder also canon multiple times including a somewhat recent arc anyway so yeah storm is absolutely incredible and the reason for this is simply not just her personality but her powers because she is able to psionically control the weather in all of its forms, big and small. And I do mean big and small. Like you might think, oh great, she can cause thunderstorm. Oh, sweet summer child. That's just the tip of the iceberg. All right. She can create multiple tornadoes at once. She can hold back a tidal wave that is a hundred million tons of water. Uh using those cyclones. She actually did that. She created cyclones just to stop a tidal wave. How does that work? I don't know, but it did. She uh, and the X-Men were actually once underwater, and she realized she could control the current of the ocean. So she controlled an entire ocean's current, millions upon millions of metric tons of water, and helped lift the, the X-Jet that they were all in underwater. She went into space after the death, after the death of Wolverine, and actually lit up the entire magnetosphere because she was grieving. <laughs> yeah, she created auroras all over the planet because she was grieving, all right? Um, speaking of which, you saw the Death Battle preview today. She has the ability to create planetary storms. In one arc, she actually, uh, with the help of Rachel, Rachel Summers, the Scott and Jean's daughter from Age of Apocalypse, uh, she was able to create what they called a primordial storm, a storm so powerful it was going to wipe the earth back into its original prehistoric state. And it was part of a storyline. But uh, and so she had that power to just wipe the slate clean on Earth. Alright? She was able to create suborbital storms that were so powerful it would be able to launch a ship deep into space. How does that work? I don't know! Um, in in uh, the, her time with the Fantastic Four, she actually had to contain the entity of Eternity. Now, there are various high-level entities of the Marvel Universe, as you all know. Eternity is one of them. It was dying, and so Doctor Strange and Storm were told that they were the only ones who had the substantial amounts of will, indomitable will, indomitable will, indomitable will, as I noted earlier, and Storm volunteered, held Eternity within herself so that he could be healed by Doctor Strange. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, and uh, she actually hurt the Silver Surfer. She once was in space and was able to use the atmosphere to create hydrogen atoms and was able to make a cloud around the Silver Surfer's head to create a lightning bolt in space. Okay. And, and I'm still only scratching the surface of all that she can do because she has not just control over making weather and bending it, ah ha ha, to her will, she is able to do so with extreme precision. So she has made lightning bolts that are so powerful and precise that she took down helicarriers from S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, in one shot. Not like raining down lightning bolts. She took one lightning bolt and struck down a helicarrier because she could. Um, she was able to go and uh, create, like I said, storms that were all over the planet. She has the ability to actually cause a seizure in your mind using electrical impulses. That was actually something also in the preview video. Uh, there, were, there were other things. She was she's also able to use things that technically aren't natural in terms of storms as you would perceive them. She, she can cause earthquakes. She can actually control lava. Yeah, she can uh, freeze people using her various control of the weather. She can actually raise and lower the humidity to any level she wants. She can affect your inner ear. 
Yeah, she can use air pressure to hurt your inner ear so that you will be in extreme pain. And um, <laughs> one time, and I, uh, this is a very this is from very very recent in the X Men uh, the X of Swords event. Sorry, uh, House of X event. They had this thing called the Crucible, and if you don't know, the X Men can now resurrect themselves with full mutant powers. A lot after this is important because they were a lot of them were depowered after uh, M Day and AKA No More Mutants. Anyway, so Storm fought her old frenemy Cal Callisto, and the point of the Crucible is that a depowered mutant goes up against a fully powered mutant in order to show that they have the willpower to die on their feet. Okay, and Storm who respected Callisto at this point, we realized like, okay, I'm, I gotta do this, but I don't have to like it, and I don't have to do it in a, an exaggerated way. So, she did not strike her down, she didn't like, tear her apart with a tornado, she literally walked up her, electrified her fist, punched her, and literally zapped her heart to death. Yeah, she caused a, a, a fatal punch. Why not? Yeah, she made she made her <laughs> electrified death punch, and it worked. And they even showed the interior panel. I saw it, and it was her punching Callisto, and then it the charge went into Callisto's body and electrocuted her heart so that it would stop and she would die. One punch did that, and this is something you need to know because everyone thinks like, oh yeah, storm. She like she flies high on the on the air currents, and she's able to you know create storms all around her, and that's true, but she is an experienced hand-to-hand -hand combat. She's had multiple times when she's had her powers taken away from her, and so with her training from T'Challa and Wolverine and, and all the other X-Men, she's in a very skilled hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the X of Swords event, she defeated one of uh, the original four horsemen of Apocalypse, who was actually, he actually called his children, known as Death, even though she was drunk, at, no kidding, drunk, and had no powers, and all she had was a, a special sword from Wakanda, long story, and she beat him in a first blood contest, so, yeah, she's a boss, and, and she was played by Halle Berry, but, yeah, she's a boss, so what are Storm's weaknesses? There, honestly, are three, the first one is her most known one, which is claustrophobia, when her parents died in a plane crash, um, she was buried under rubble for days, and, uh, Though she was able to get out, it left her in a state of hating tight spaces. It was actually a very major plot point for many storm st storm stories, storm stories, and as a result of this, she hates being under uh, rubble or being in boxed in spaces to the point where, she, at one point in her timeline, she would actually become just almost catatonic. You know, like not able to do anything. However, she has gotten over this. And in a death battle, while this would affect her, it would not, it will not cripple her because, again, she has overcome this. Uh, second is that while she does have mastery over weather, that doesn't mean that the weather is going to bend to her will in certain cases. She once tried to stop a blizzard that was covering most of Canada. She did it, but it took days to do, and it almost killed her. And this also expresses how her natural body has to endure the stresses that she's putting on it through the weather in order to survive. She can do incredible things, but even she has a limit. So, with that, who wins between Korra and Storm? It's Storm. It's not even close. <laughs> like, I love Korra. Again, I will name my daughter after her. But the difference here is tears. Okay, if you want to be fair, if, like, you know the whole, like, island, continent, planetary, multiversal level. If you want to be fair here, I would label Korra as continent level at max, all right? We've seen the avatars do incredible things, and I heard someone even say, like, the avatar bend the moon. I don't, I don't believe that one. But, uh, she, she is powerful. Storm is more powerful. Again, she has done things that have literally eclipsed the planet, or even wiped the planet clean. All right, she makes things happen on her on her own. And one of the things I didn't mention about Storm is that her emotions directly tie into how powerful her attacks are. She is so composed that it allows her that great level of precision. But she can lose it and just cause this violent storm that'll hurt everyone around her. She works hard to not do that. And so now imagine a death battle where she doesn't have to hold back, and she could just let loose on Korra. Korra is fast enough to uh, speed along on air currents. We saw, I think, we saw 
Aang running at a very fast speed via his own airbending, and she can propel herself via fire feet. Fire feet, like that. Uh, and everything. But Storm is able to react at much faster things at times, not to mention the fact that she wields lightning, which Korra canonically cannot not cannot avoid nor redirect. She does not know the redirect technique from Iroh, nor does she ever lightning bend like her BFF slash former flame Mako. All right, she's not done that, and so there is no reason to believe that Korra could just simply dodge it or withstand it. Not to mention, even in the Avatar state, she's not invincible. Aang almost died in the Avatar state, as did Korra multiple times. All right, and as we mentioned, as I mentioned, we mentioned we the people. As I mentioned earlier, Cor uh, Storm's abilities are so precise that she can affect things big and small. She can cause a seizure in Korra's brain and put her down. She all it takes is one punch to electrocute her heart, and she's done. And when you know Korra's going to want to get in close because that's her style. She prefers up close and personal combat while Storm te usually likes to keep things longer distance but is not afraid to get up close and personal. Not to mention she has way more experience than Korra in fighting in, in massive situations. Don't forget, three years of her life, Korra barely did anything because she was healing from her poison state and then a lot of her upbringing was fighting against very specific kinds of fighters to help her uh, manifest her bending techniques. Cor uh, Storm's been going up against humans, mutants, gods, aliens, heralds, and everything for countless decades. Uh, it, out of canon decades, but in canon, let's just say it's many, many years. So, uh, Storm has so many more ways to hurt Korra, not to mention the fact that even if Korra could encase Storm in Earth, which is not a guarantee, uh, she wouldn't know to do that because she doesn't, she doesn't know that uh, Storm is claustrophobic, at least a little now. Um, but Storm can break out of it. Storm can break out of it easily. And Storm can injure and hurt Korra various ways so that she can't use her bending. Remember, it's a bending technique, not just I am summoning uh, these elements to do what I want. You, she can do that in certain instances, like with Fire Blast or with a Dragon Breath, but more, her more complex techniques require bending motions to enable things to happen. Well, Storm is just like lightning, bang, done. So as much as I love Korra, and I, I'm a big X-Men fan, if you can't tell, um, Korra is great. <laughs> Storm's just greater. So I'm totally picking Storm for this matchup. Uh and with that, I will end this episode. Todd, Todd, who do you think is going to win between Korra and Storm? How much fun do you think this battle is going to be? And what do you think is going to be the final blow that Storm totally deals to Korra? Uh, let me know in the comments below. So, I thank you for watching. If you made this far, I know you were listening, and I'll see you around.